First of all, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we are so excited to welcome you here this morning for the launch briefing for our Center for Data-Driven Policy. Uh, for those of you who joined in the past few minutes, you should be able to hear my voice and see my video. We're also sharing a slide, so do make sure that all of your settings are working. Um, and before we begin, I just wanna make a few reminders. Our session will be recorded for those who are unable to attend and give them the opportunity to enjoy this session. And do please be advised that members of the media may be attending. So without further ado, I do want to introduce to you Jim Cook. Jim is MITRE's Vice President of Strategic Engagement and Partnership. Over to you, Jim. Thanks, Nicole. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our launch, MITRE's Center for Data-Driven Policy. As Nicole said, we're very excited about today and we're grateful that you're grateful for your interest and your participation today. As Nicole said, we have attendees today from Congress, OMB, the media, the private sector, academia, and the policy advisory community. I'm Jim Cook, Vice President for Strategic Engagement and Partnerships. Before I begin sharing a little bit more information about the Policy Center, I would like to recognize and thank our special guests and participants today, including Representative Will Hurd and Representative Robin Kelly. Good morning and thank you for joining us this morning. The Honorable Mignon Clyburn, former Acting Chair and Commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission and currently Principal MLC Strategies. Good morning, Mignon. And Dan Shenock, Executive Director, IBM Business of Government Center. Good morning, Dan. And thanks again to all of you for joining us today. We're excited about this new initiative. As you hear from each one of us this morning, you'll hear some common themes, commitment to public service, the mission of government, and an understanding of what it looks like on the implementation side. I've been with MITRE for about 16 years, and I've spent 22 years prior to that in the private sector, all of which helping federal, state, and local agencies implement and manage programs and address technology, organization, and process issues. I've learned a lot about how policy can be at times an enabler and other times a barrier. I also have had a chance to work with many talented and committed people in government and the private sector who are just trying to get a job done. I come from a pub family of public servants and veterans, and this is what really drives me, effective government that delivers results. For the first 13 years at MITRE, I led one of our FFRDCs, helping agencies do just that, deliver better results through modernization. So what is this policy center all about? Diverse opinions on policy aren't bad. Different perspectives on what to do and how usually make for better decisions and outcomes. But it's also helpful if you can agree on the existence, impact, and scope of a problem. Two of our featured guests today, Representative Hurd and Representative Kelly, are role models in that regard. The partnership that they forged on issues impacting the effectiveness of government, especially around how technology is adopted and managed, is a prime example of how good policy can be developed when there is a shared understanding of the problem, a commitment to solving it, and access to evidence, data, and expertise, and a willingness to use it. Many of your organizations have data. You do research, you develop and use models, and you have experts as well. We've seen much of your work, and in many cases, we've referenced it. We've also worked with some of you in partnership and shared with many of you ideas and insights we have as well. While much of what we plan to do through the Policy Center is not new, our objective is to make a more consistent and persistent contribution to the policy process by drawing on what we do well. Nicole, let's show the video. From Capitol Hill to the White House, policymakers and lawmakers are faced with cutting through a chorus of voices, identifying workable ideas, and turning them into actionable policies. The mission of MITRE Center for Data-Driven Policy is to expand the role of evidence-based research and information in the development of policy. We're nonpartisan. We don't take political positions. We draw on MITRE's deep technical expertise and systems thinking capabilities, and from MITRE's own labs and independent research programs. Through public-private partnerships and federally funded R&D centers, MITRE tackles challenges to the safety, stability, and well-being of our nation. The Center for Data-Driven Policy translates those insights to the policy domain, providing experience-based recommendations to support outcome-based, equitable, and measurable policy solutions. We partner with government, industry, universities, think tanks, and nonprofits 
addressing problems like protecting the integrity of our elections, fighting financial fraud and reducing improper payments, ensuring ethics and fairness in government use of artificial intelligence, and sharing data and insights on the coronavirus to inform decision makers. We're the Center for Data-Driven Policy. Learn more at MITRE.org slash Policy Center. So let me build on a little bit of what you heard in the video. MITRE operates seven federally funded research and development centers. That's pretty well known. We also manage 16 platforms, which bring together data people, partners, and information resources to work on a variety of challenges. Technologies like AI and 5G, and to work on topics such as health analytics, social integrity and disinformation, cybersecurity, and social justice. In addition, labs like our Identity Lab, Analytic Toolshed, and Policy Lab, and our simulation and experimentation environment are all, all sources of data and evidence that we use today to inform policy discussions as well as agency level plans. Finally, tools we've created and made publicly available are also providing valuable data evidence to decision makers. I'll share a couple of examples. Squint, a mobile application, which is free and publicly available, that allows the public to crowdsource disinformation they find on social media platforms to share with election officials so they can issue factual information to their communities. This tool has also already been repurposed to help identify and counter disinformation around COVID-19. The COVID-19 dashboard was created as a dynamic data tool to merge various types of data and indicators. It's being used by some policymakers at the state and local levels to make decisions around what to do about their interventions and other measures to help control the pandemic, reopen schools, and their economies. And PolicyNet, an open source tool that we use to facilitate the analysis of statutes, policy, and guidance, and to map the flow down impacts of changes. This can also be used to run what if scenarios prior to adopting policy changes or legislative changes to understand the impacts throughout the system and identify unintended consequences or inconsistencies across statutes, policies, and agencies. The challenges we face as a government and a nation are complex and seem to be compounding daily. The answers aren't in technology alone or process or oversight or even leadership. As you all know, it's not that simple. Data helps us all better understand the causes and effects and to test and evaluate potential answers. And policy plays an important role in those solutions. But it requires everyone who can help to step up. We're proud of our history and what we've contributed over the past 61 years, and we wanna do more. That's what this center is all about, to create the channel for us to add our voice to yours, to combine our insights and to work together in the public interest. The Center for Data-Driven Policy is a resource to all of you. We look forward to working with all of you in the months and years ahead to make a difference through evidence-based policy. So now I'd like to introduce Dave Pounder. Many of you know him. He's our Director for Strategic Engagement and Partnerships and our Executive Director for the Data-Driven Policy Center. Dave, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, prior to my time here at MITRE, I led GAO's IT work for about 15 years and had the opportunity to inform Congress and OMB on legislative and policy actions. I witnessed firsthand many times how policy was developed and implemented. So I'm very excited about enhancing MITRE's efforts to get our data, evidence, and research that Jim just mentioned into the hands of policymakers and working in partnership with many of your organizations even more closely. This morning, we have an exciting agenda that consists of three segments. First, we will hear from Congress on several tech policy areas. After that, we have a moderated discussion on equitable AI. And then we will finish up with an overview of a series of papers we will be releasing today. After the first two segments, we will have about 10 minutes for questions, and we greatly look forward to your interaction. First up, it's a pleasure to welcome Representatives Robin Kelly and Will Hurt. I had the good fortune of assisting them with their legislative oversight, and I have to say their oversight on government IT topics was the most thorough and persistent I saw during my time in the legislative branch. Representative Robin Kelly from Illinois has served in the House since 2013 and is currently on the Oversight and Reform and Energy and Commerce Committees. Will Hurd from Texas has served since 2015 and is currently on the Appropriations and Intel 
They have both been leading congressional voices on technology issues. This has included overseeing the implementation of FATARA, passing the MGT Act, holding numerous hearings on AI, and recently they partnered with the Bipartisan Policy Center in publishing a series of white papers that led to a congressional resolution that was introduced this last week. We have asked them to share their insights on this resolution and what's next on the legislative front for topics like AI, IT modernization, and next generation technologies. Before I turn it over to them, I want to thank Representatives Kelly and Hurd for their leadership on these topics and for setting the example for bipartisanship. Robin, you want to go first? You want me to you want me to go first? I'll go first for a change and then you can clean up whatever I say. And, and, and Robin, remember, Nicole said that this is being recorded and there's press on the line, so don't be inappropriate. I think that was directed at you. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Good morning and thank you, Dave, so much. Since you left GAO, we have certainly missed you. We don't know if you feel the same way and you've missed us, but uh, thank you so much. And I also want to thank MITRE and the new center for data-driven policy, for organizing this conversation. And it's always wonderful to see the Honorable um, Mignon Clyburn. So I'm, I'm honored to be on the stage with you. As many of you know, my esteemed partner who's leaving me introduced a bipartisan congressional resolution calling for a comprehensive and whole of government approach to artificial intelligence. Uh, if you're Googling right now, it's HCON Res 116, how appropriate. We figured it's time for government, the whole government, to get on the same page when it comes to artificial intelligence, because that's the only way we can preserve our superiority in the quest for advanced technologies. We already know AI is fundamentally changing and will continue to change key aspects of our lives, whether it's government, national security, or our workplaces. It's already impacting places of work, the delivery of government services, and frankly, how we protect ourselves from external threats. But the resolution is just one part of a project that Will and I have been working on for over a year with the Bipartisan Policy Center. And the end result was this resolution and four white papers addressing AI and national security, the workforce, research and development, and ethics. If you're interested in reading them all, you can go to robinkelly.house.gov. In the top corner, you can search AI to find the resolution and download the white papers. Now, I mentioned this process to craft these white papers took a year, but that wasn't well on my first adventure with AI technology and challenges. As Dave said, we were the uh, chair, Will was a chair, and I was the ranking member, and we um, really sat down and craft a course, course of things that we needed to do. And um, to maybe to other people's surprise, but not our surprise, we did it in a very bipartisan way. And we like to tell people that Democrats and Republicans do get along better than people think. And, uh, you know, we wanted to get things done. We undertook, as you've heard, major, major revisions to how the government purchases technology and secures its systems. Um, many of you, in fact, were a part of the MGT Act reality. Then we pushed for greater access via mobile devices as a way to close the digital divide with my Connected Government Act. And just last week, we passed the uh, Internet of Things Cybersecurity Improvement Act. And I think that will be the last thing uh, that we will do uh, together, unfortunately. When looking to technologies that were going to disrupt the tech se sector, AI was at the top of the list. In those conversations, we realized that we couldn't get it done in just one Congress. The issues were too big and questions were just too complex. We also knew this challenge needed to be addressed and addressed promptly because the stakes are just so high. So we hosted a series of hearings and issued a, re a report as a placeholder. One, one report was the first ever congressional report on artificial intelligence, and that was back in 2018. So it's amazing that we've ignored this issue for so long. And then we picked up the ball after the 2018 election and started working with the Bipartisan Policy Center. And throughout this process, one thing was clear, the level of change already created and the level of impact expected by AI requires our government to think long, hard, and strategically about our future. No one department or branch can address these issues alone. We truly are all in this together. 
with AI impacting every sector from national security and military hardware to HR and payroll processing. We need a comprehensive whole of government approach, as I've said, that leverages public private partnerships to our greatest advantage. But this can only happen if we work together and one hand knows what the other hand is doing. So, you know, I look forward to your comments and uh, you reading the reports, you reading the resolutions and tell us, you know, what you think. I have to find another partner uh, to work on this the next Congress, but my door is always open. So in close, I just want to thank you for everything you guys have done, done for your support. And again, please read the white papers and let us know what you're thinking. And with that, I turn it over to my esteemed colleague, my forever friend, Congressman Will Hurt. <laughs> Robin, you always hurt my feelings. You act like I'm I'm dying, you know, girl. I'm you still around, mean, you know. We die. could, you know, I I, I, can't, I may not be able to put my name on the as as, uh, as your as your supporter on the bill, but you know, I'll be calling your office, you I'm know, sure. and giving my giving my input. Um, like, uh, it's 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 always wonderful uh, to be with with Robin, and and I'm I am um, uh, glad that I've gotten to know Commissioner Clyburn as well, and Dave Pounder is the man. Uh, Jim, whoever brought uh, Dave to MITRE deserves a, a raise, a, a pay bump, because uh, Dave is, a, is truly a, a national treasure, and, and I will say that um, because uh, one of the first things that I, that, that I learned, and, and, and before I get to that, I want to talk about how Robin and I ultimately developed this, this relationship. Uh, when we became the, I, I like to say we were co-chairs of, of, of the committee, um, when, when I came in, I said, okay, here are some of the things we want to do, share it with Robin and see if she was cool with it. And my staff was like, we don't share what the next, what the next hearings are going to be with the, with the minority. I'm like, why not? That's insane you know and and so that i told them go share it with them and they shared it and then and then the minority staff robin staff was like why are y'all sharing this with us <laughs> like like it was a trick and and so we were able to to establish that 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 trust early on and, and i will say one of the th one of my takeaways was the impact of keeping keeping score and the Fratara scorecard. Now, now Fratara, uh, I wasn't in Congress when, when this was passed. Um, I like to say, and I get in trouble for saying this, if, um, if Jerry Conley and, um, and why am I drawing a blank, Robin? Mark Meadows. No, and, and from San Diego. Um, Dave. Dave. Daryl, Daryl, I, 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 sorry, Daryl. I'm, I'm having a moment. I haven't had coffee this morning. If, if, if Daryl and, and, and Jerry were the mother and father of Fratara, then Robin and I were the wet nurse, right? We're the one that, that brought it, that brought it, um, that brought it forward. And the scorecard was the idea of GAO and Dave Pounder. And I'll be honest, I was suspicious at the beginning about whether this was going to work. And and I and I was new, so I said, hey, let's give it a whirl and see and see uh, and see what happens. I can say that that scorecard really did change behaviors, changed how the government operated because we were keeping score. There were things that we were measuring. And so as, as MITRE is, is focused on this evidence-based policy, that evidence-based policy also has to be measurable because if you give Congress and when you give the oversight committee something in order to shine a light on, then, then that helps. And, and if we can focus on the, the lead measures, right? Um, when I was a junior in high school, somehow I got, I read uh, Stephen Covey's, you know, Highly Effective Habits of, of, of People, or seven, seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and I've been following that. And they also have this, this concept of, of, of principles of execution. And one of them is to keep a compelling scoreboard, and that you should be focusing on lead measures versus lag measures. And those lead measures are, what are those things that if we do over and over and over, is gonna produce something that, that we wanna measure? And, and so how do we, how can we take that concept in, into the policy realm? And I think the Fatara scorecard was, was one of those examples. And, and Dave, I know you testified a couple of weeks ago, I think that was a number 14, right? Um, or number 10, Fatara yeah. scorecard 10. And it was the first time everybody got passing grades. Um, the fact that the digital infrastructure of the federal government, the .gov space was so bad 
right? Um, and and to see that we got to that that place in in less than in less than six years. Six years may seem like a lot. I, I'll be frank. I didn't expect that it was going to it was going to improve the way it did. And I think you're seeing those improvements be exponential. And so, so when we when we develop, okay, what is that good policy? How can we measure that so that we can empower the oversight committees um, in order to keep track and keep score? And and I think that is that is um, you know Robin was explaining all the things that that we we've really done together. You're like, man, we did you know we did a lot in, in a couple of years, right? And um, but but I, I think one of the lasting efforts is that that to show how oversight really works, right? And that people care about about the scorecard. And 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 one of the things I used to love, and I'll end with this, Dave. I'm, I'm rambling a little bit. I apologize. Um, you know, we would send out these reports, and we were going to hammer, you know, some agency for something, and then they showed up. And, and we're like, what happened about that thing? And they're like, oh, what are you talking about, Congressman? We fixed it last night, you know? And you're like, okay, you can't yell at them anymore. But guess what? We got a result, right? And so if that meant a more boring hearing, I'm okay with that uh, because we had the action enabled. And so, so the work that y'all are gonna be doing at, at this MITRE evidence-based policy entity um, to be able to sit that frame, hey, this is what you should do. Do, but you also are going to have to say, here's how you measure the ability to to get to that policy, and that is a tool that some of our colleagues are going to be able to do. So that's that's my that's my two cents, Dave. And and honestly, uh, a lot of those actions wouldn't have been able to happen without you and and, and your team. And and I also have to give a shout out to, to Robin and and our staffs over the years. Uh, because they're the ones that help execute on some of the ideas that that Robin and, and I had, and and I've learned I've learned so much from from Robin Kelly, and we're we're still gonna work together, uh, Robin, and I'm gonna keep harassing you because uh, you can't you can't quit me you can't quit me, Robin. So, uh, um, so there. Thanks for having us, Representative Hurd. Thank you for your comments, Representative Kelly. Uh, and we hear you on the measurable piece. I mean, that's a big part of what we're gonna try to really drive home, you know, with our policy centers to keep that, that those measurements to make sure that policy, when we do get really effective policy, we have a way to ensure that we have better implementation than we have, you know, looking back historically over at various uh, policies. Uh, we're gonna ask for some questions from the audience, but if I could just kick it off, uh, you know, it was really impressive, your congressional resolution that was just uh, released last week, you know, almost 80 action items in the various areas. Mm -hmm. And um, and I know there was a lot of hard work from the BPC and you guys held numerous hearings on that. What, what do you see that congressional, if you could crystal ball and uh, look at that congressional resolution where you would like to see it go eventually with the next Congress, you know, what, what do you envision well, Robin, I'm going I'm to take this one. Um, so the, the goal is to get that passed this year, period, in, in the story. The reason we did it as a resolution um, was because we thought that would address some of the tricky, uh, the, and I, 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 this, saying this word kills me because I hate it, jurisdictional issues, right? Like that has been one of the things that's driven me crazy. And so that's why we do it as a resolution. Now, the, the other idea is to take those 80 plus um, recommendations and turn those into individual bills, right? Can we narrow them as as much as possible? And because because that makes it easier to pass. So the idea is the resolution is the framework on a number of activities that are going to that are going to be done over the next possibly couple of Congresses, right? And 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 how do you how do you get the concepts together on workforce on ethics? on um, research, on national security, the broader perspective that I think most people can agree on. And, and we set a cardinal direction on, on where we're going. And then you can have some of the debates on, on, the, on the specifics. And that's gonna live beyond you know, uh, this Congress and, and the next one. So we're trying to, uh, science and, and um, the s and committee, I think has a jurisdiction of, of the resolution. We're trying to make sure that we're getting the key folks there, and then, you know, in, in potentially in the lame duck, um, 
we get this, we get this pass. And so Robin and I are already twisting arms, um, not only to get co-sponsors, but to, to get people to pass this. So folks that are on this call, uh, letters of support, you know, advocacy with, with um, you know, the, the key, key congressional leaders here in Congress on science and technology and also leadership um, would, be, would be good. But this is something that, that the goal is to get this done. And, and part of this, and, and, and you know, this, is, this is a race, right? This is a race. We are in a generational defining struggle with the Chinese government. And the Chinese government is trying to surpass the United States of America as the sole hegemon in this country. And they're going to, they, they think they can do this by being the world's leader in advanced technology, about 12 categories, one of those categories being AI. There is no second place. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm starting to, to describe this similar to the Sputnik moment, right? Um, President Eisenhower knew, and, and, and folks within the federal government knew that the Russians were working on a satellite. They didn't think Sputnik really mattered. Right, because it was small, and you're like, okay, it's kind of like a science project. But what people didn't know, there was a Sputnik 2 that came up a, a week later, and that was large enough to carry the, the largest nuclear warhead of the Russian government, right? And that's when everybody was like, uh oh, we need to do something about that, right? So we're, we're in a race, we're in a battle. That's why this national strategy was so important to, to say, hey, we all need to be working together. Oh, and by the way, the federal government can't do it by itself. Private sector can't do it by itself. Academia can't do it by itself. We all got to do this together. So, so that, was the, that was the goal of this. And, and BPC was fantastic in helping us. But even more important was the number of people that participated um, in all of our convenings, in these conversations. The debates were, were fantastic. Excellent. Representative Kelly, you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, you know, we, we talk about Will and I, you know, being uh, so bipartisan, but I, we've talked about how the Obama administration and the Trump administration both realize that this is uh, very important and did pay, you know, attention to this issue. And also, as we were having meetings, there were different members of Congress that also, you know, came into the room, had their input. So I, I think that our colleagues realize how very, very important this is, that it's important for us to be team players globally, but we want to be the leaders. We, we want to help set the rules. Excellent. Well, I see we have some additional questions coming in from the audience. So uh, Tom from uh, Wired, you, you there? Yeah, and this, uh, Dave, this is Tim Persons. I have a question as well. When uh, okay, right. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll get to you next then, there, Tim. Tom, are you there? Tim, why don't you jump in? We'll come back to Tom. Sure, I'll do that. So I just want to start. Thanks uh, to uh, uh, Congresswoman Kelly and to Congressman Hurd. Uh, for their leadership and for what they've been doing. Uh, I'm Tim Persons, I'm the chief scientist of GAO and then the managing director for our newest team on science, technology assessment and analytics. Uh, I did want to, uh, you know, again, second uh, Congressman Hurd's, uh, you know, high marks for um, Dave. I, you know, I regret losing Dave uh, out of GAO to MITRE, but it's actually a good thing in the sense of AI and s and policy is really a team sport, and I think everybody here, uh, there's so much to do uh, in a coordinated way. I, I really appreciate that. We at GAO have been doing things in AI since 2018, a strategic report, a three-part series now in, in partnership with the National Academy of Medicine on AI and medicine, and now an oversight framework for AI accountability that we're just now putting together and did under a Comptroller General Forum thing. My question for the members is that given your leadership and strategies that, that uh, Congresswoman Kelly uh, listed, um, there's so much to do. The risk here is that we try and boil the ocean. I, on the other hand, we know there's an urgent sense, like Mr. Hurd just said. So uh, as a, a, an apparatus for Congress and as, I guess, a, a member of this node of this community that's online here, are there any priorities that you all might have for what we could do next. Like there's so much to do, what might be the priorities from the member's perspective? Thank you. Are you saying priorities from our four points like national security, workforce, and in, in that way, is that what you mean? You 
Why don't you answer that question, Robert? Yeah, sorry. So I was I was muted right after that. So I think in, in the sense that we have to win on national security, we have to win on the STEM workforce, we have to do these things, it cuts across all the jurisdictions. Are there any policy priorities cross jurisdictionally or, or otherwise that that um, this community should work on to help advance the overall goal? Um, the concern being if we try and do everything at once in the policy, it, it might uh, not go as well. So are there priorities that you all think we ought to pursue? Thank you. Well, for me, I do think they're all important. And in a way, you can't have one without the other. But I do look at national security. And Will knows my big, big thing is workforce, that if we're not preparing um, our young people now, then they're not going to be able to um, fill these jobs. I mean, I, I represent a district that's urban, suburban, and rural. And in the rural part of my district, when I was doing uh, census briefings, I was told 40% of the people can't even go online to fill out the census. They don't, they don't have the capacity. So if people can't even do that, how will they eat? How, you know, there's gonna be jobs lost but there are going to be new jobs, but are we preparing the next generation and even now for people to, you know, take those jobs, you know, you know, to make sure that we're nationally secure or the, to do the research and development. So that's something very near and dear to my heart, but of course, national security um, comes first also, you know, but um, so those are the two things that I look at, even though it's all very, very important. Yeah, and, and, and I, I would agree with, with Robin and, and echo that. Um, it, we have to train our kids for jobs that don't exist today. And then we have to pe prepare people whose industries are going to be impacted. There will be disruption, right? There, there, there's no question about that. And, and so how do we make sure um, industries are going to be disrupted, that those individuals are able to be able to, to um, uh, uh, participate in that evolution of that industry? And, and so how do we prepare our, 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 our folks for that. And I also think in, uh, immigration plays a role there too, because are we attracting the best and the brightest from all over the world in order to contribute uh, to, to our programs and our strategies? And, and I think something that's as simple as, you know, we have to look, rethink our education system. And, and, and I believe introducing coding into, in, I, I would say we should be taking it in elementary school, um, but can we get it in the, in the seventh grade, right? And, and how do you do that? Because that means you got to have teachers that would be able to introduce that and all those kinds of things. So, so that, that's an effort that I plan to spend a, a, a little bit of time on. However, um, the, the goal with what we're doing is saying, hey, here's a broad enough strategy, but everybody has their role. Every committee has their has their function every regulatory agency has their responsibility so we want those entities thinking about what is their number one priority so so you should have a priority at the fec you should have a priority at the sec you should have a priority at housing and urban development and you don't need one person we don't need a department of artificial intelligence telling everybody what to do you need every department and agency figuring this out and, and so, so I think that's what we're trying to do with, with our strategy. And what I would like to see, and I think this goes to Tim's question, I can see it in the box here, you know, had an ultimate measure or score for agencies, um, AI adoption, and what would that look like? I, I wanna see in the next Congress, in the oversight plans of every committee, they should be asking questions about artificial intelligence. So, so we know we, you gotta have data, you gotta have high capacity compute and you gotta have the algorithms, right? And, and how do you merge those three? And so, and this is a tool. So how are the agencies that these congressional committees oversee, how are they looking at um, organizing data, keeping track of data, protecting the data? Um, how are they potentially using, what kind of algorithms, what kind of questions are they trying to ask? And so if we have the oversight people asking these questions, and then we have the regulatory bodies and the agencies coming in and answering them and forcing them to think this, that's how you spur uh, that innovation. And, and, and um, um, Tim, we need those smart engineers when y'all, you know, I'm gonna look at y'all's oversight for AI accountability plan. I hope there's some, some beautiful scorecard like the Fatara scorecard uh, that we can use. I don't know what that is, but I think that's the next um, ev evolution of, of this document 
and um, plan that that Rob and I have been been great to be able to work with. But also, we have to make sure you know on committees and um, that we are working with people that are knowledgeable, like like Dave left us, you know what I mean? Um, so like, that's a concern too. How many times, you know, have we heard that, um, you know, we're asking uh, questions about witnesses and we, we're not as knowledgeable because we can't know everything, you know, like Will heard, we can't know everything. And uh, so, you know, we need that help with staff too that are very knowledgeable. I thank God for um, uh, my, staff for Matt McMurray. He has helped me so much and Will has been very patient with me because I always say he's at the 30,000 foot level, but I'm the regular uh, man or woman on the street as far as, you know, and I've learned so much, but so I bring that perspective, you know, the 5,000 foot level uh, uh, to the party. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, and it looks like, uh, Representative Heard, you answered that one question in the chat. Uh, are there any other questions out there? Because we do want to be respectful of your time. So any other questions in the audience? I don't see any more coming in from the, uh, through, through the chat. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, then. And, and Dave, I, I, just, I, I know, I think we're going to be hearing from, from uh, Commissioner Clyburn, but, but I think you know, this is another example of how you have a great organization like the National Security um, AI Commission that is that is working. You know, a lot of their, they're talking specifically about national security is so important, but some of the the issues that they're bringing to the forefront are outside the realm of the national security committees, right? When you talk about education, uh, that's workforce and development, and so, so these things are are, are connected. And, and again, we're, you know, an authoritarian government can marshal all their factors of production in the one direction and get somewhere first, right? But I will always take free markets and entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship um, and, and distributed systems over, over that any day of the week. And it's good that we have all these entities working on this um, because it's the, the, the problem set is too big and, and you can't, you're never going to be able to solve it with one you know, master, you know, I, I know algorithms is trying to get to a master algorithm, right? Uh, but, it, you know, it doesn't exist yet. Um, and so we got to have everybody, everybody working together and doing their part. And so I, I think what you're seeing, and, and Dave, you know this better, um, the fact that, you know, Robin and I produced the first report on AI, right? And then I think this Congress, I think every committee um, has had you know, hearings on, on this. And, and so, so I, I think this, I, I think I will say, um, you know, while we are in a very contentious political environment, I think uh, everybody recognizes the importance of this technology and moving forward. And that's, I think that's, that's, that's reflective in, in all of our works. Okay. Well, uh, thank you both very much. You make a wonderful tag team and uh, we're going to miss seeing you two work together, but uh, Again, thank you for uh, everything that you've done and uh, for participating today. We will, we will definitely be in touch down the road. Thank uh, you. So uh, ne next up, uh, we're going to have Dwayne Blackburn introduce uh, our moderator for the next session. Dwayne is a key member of our center's leadership team. He has uh, much experience in the science and technology policy arena. Thanks, Dave. It's a pleasure to work with you and all of MITRE as we launch the Center for Data-Driven Policy. As Dave mentioned, my background is in science and technology policy. Specifically, I served as a policy analyst and assistant director of the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy for eight years, spanning two different presidential administrations. Most know of this office via its policy setting role in determining and fulfilling whole of government research and development priorities through the National Science and Technology Council. I did a lot of work in that regard while at OSTP, but I honestly spent more of my time fulfilling OSTP's policy guidance role as I worked to ensure that s and capabilities and issues were properly understood and integrated into the policy work of the Homeland and National Security Councils as we crafted and revised the nation's initial Homeland Security posture and policies. Leveraging new capabilities and operational tactics while simultaneously establishing oversight capabilities for privacy and civil liberties protections was certainly a challenge. And I honestly think that challenge continues today, but it does look a little bit different. 
While our federal privacy and civil liberties apparatus has certainly matured over the ensuing years, science and technology cap capabilities have advanced much, much faster. We also now live in an environment that is routinely impacted by the unknowing spread of misinformation and purposeful use of disinformation, making it much more difficult for the policy community to obtain the trustworthy insights they require. All of these factors are certainly pronounced in the nation's current deliberations surrounding the ethical and equitable use of artificial intelligence. So we decided that should be the focus of our second panel today. And we again have some outstanding leaders from this community volunteering to discuss the importance of leveraging data and experience in crafting AI policies. Our moderator is Dan Chinook, the executive director of the IBM Center for the Business of Government and a former branch chief at the White House Office of Management and Budget. Dan? Well, thank you so much, Dwayne, and, and uh, really appreciate being here. Congratulations to MITRE uh, for the launch of the new center. Um, what a terrific panel, and hearing from uh, Representatives Kurt and Kelly, and thanks for their leadership, and thanks to also Dave Pounder uh, and Jim Cook for just framing a terrific discussion. Um, it's my uh, honor to introduce our great panel today. Um, uh, first, uh, the Honorable Mignon Clyburn, who you've heard about uh, during this discussion already. Um, Ms. Clyburn served as commissioner on the Federal Communications Commission from 2009 to 2018, and is the acting chair from May to October to November of 2013. She is currently the principal of MLC Strategies LLC. Uh, during her nine years at the FCC, Commissioner Clyburn was committed to closing persistent digital and opportunities divides that continue to challenge rural, native, and low wealth communities emphasizing diversity and inclusion in STEM opportunities and fought to preserve a free and open internet. Uh, previously, Commissioner Clyburn served 11 years on the South Carolina Public Service Commission. And prior to that, she was publisher and general manager of Coastal Times, a family founded Charleston based weekly newspaper focusing on issues affecting the African American community. Clyburn also has most recently held a fellowship at the Open Society Foundation. Thank you, Mignon, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. Chuck Howell uh, is also with us. Chuck is Chief Scientist for Dependable AI at the MITRE Corporation. He's focused on adopting tools and techniques from high assurance systems engineering to AI systems to efficiently mitigate concerns about fairness, operational risk, technical debt, and credibility. Chuck has over 30 years of experience working in high assurance systems engineering and AI. He previously held technology leadership roles at numerous companies, he was a member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Software and Engineering Body of Knowledge Industrial Advisory Board, and he's chaired numerous other technology boards and commissions. Chuck, welcome. Pleasure. Thank you. So in, in hearing from the remarks of Representatives Heard and Kelly, especially about their concurrent resolution, which addresses many things that the, con that the uh, congressman and congresswoman talked about, uh, it also addresses the issues of diversity and the digital divide ethics and equity. Um, these are our principles that leading companies and governments around the world have begun to adopt in terms of how they approach AI strategy and how they develop software applications and solutions for AI that focus on things like data fairness, transparency and explainability of algorithms so people understand uh, what the AI is doing when it's uh, uh, assessing data about them, accuracy of data, and the ability of users to access that data and understand where it is flowing. Um, technology and, and strategies that can also drive equity in AI using these principles, helping government and industry to leverage AI-driven data that promotes equitable and ethical values. So with this in mind, I wanted to uh, turn to Commissioner Clyburn for the first question. Uh, uh, Commissioner Clyburn, you've led many initiatives, both as FCC Commissioner and since, that focus on the importance of how an educated workforce um, and building skill sets across diverse populations creates a foundation for bringing social equity to technology development. How do you see this strategy informing the work of the inputs to AI, the building of AI models and application, the workforce that does this, especially those developed by and for governments? Again, uh, thank you for having me. For me, when uh, just listening to the last exchange and digesting your question, uh, one thing to me is clear um, that, uh, well, a, a number of things are clear, but what one thing um, is especially clear, people matter and they matter more than ever before. 
Uh, and one of the things that we see missing, chronically missing when it comes to the design, when it comes uh, often to the application uh, of, of, of many of uh, these um, either devices or, app, or applications uh, in, in, this, uh, in, in this sense, is that um, at the inception stage, um, at the design stage, um, there has not been the robust and proper amount of diversity and inclusion. And I'm being very um, polite uh, when I phrase it that way. Uh, there is a well-documented diversity problem uh, and um, our too casual attention to this up until recently is problematic on multiple fronts. Um, I distinctly remember my first um, sort of AI interaction um, that, I, that I was conscious of uh, is um, I, I was in an innovation center and everybody else could, uh, you know, their faces were seen and mine was uh, not seen at all. Um, there is, when it, when it comes to facial recognition and other um, types of technologies uh, uh, that could have uh, uh, public safety and other applications, um, I am virtually invisible or I am being typecast in a way in part because at the design phase and at the phase where things were, um, I, I guess you would say, when the evaluation stage before uh, the purchase uh, from a particular entity, some of those elements uh, were not caught uh, before it became ubiquitous or uh, adopted uh, by whatever entity. So what is important here is at the beginning, at inception, um, that uh, we have an inclusive uh, workforce design team. Uh, and if that is not the case, then the blind spots that we all have, by the way, uh, will not be caught uh, by others. Really interesting perspective. And, and a key element is that data that feeds AI should represent the world, that the AI data is, is, is assessing and an and inclusive workforce really is key to that, that input. Again, you're talking about a system that is learning from those uh, that input. Um, and, and so uh, again, AI has this incredible promise that we all know to continue. It is and it will continue to transform our society and our economy. Uh, it is not learning on its own. Those imports, it, uh, you know, those inputs are, are not uh, you know, being uh, germinated or, or generated on its own. You've got people. Um, who are uh, partnering and in, uh, that it is learning from. And uh, it will learn um, our, our better um, you know, elements or characteristics, or it will learn um, our uh, deep-seated bias. Uh, uh, and so we, we've got to be mindful of that at inception. Great insights. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. So Chuck, let's turn to the other side. Let's turn to the outputs um, from AI. And, and in your work as an industry expert on emerging technologies, you, you've addressed these outputs from technology, including risks and how to optimize benefits, how to manage risks, and, and bringing benefits to diverse groups. Um, how does this apply to the people who are served by AI applications in government? You've referred to this uh, as disparate benefit. Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. It's a privilege to be on the same uh, panel with both of you. Um, so as Commissioner Clyburn just put a spotlight on, there are widespread legitimate concerns about the potential unintended consequences of the adoption of AI and general machine learning in particular in any kind of consequential environment. And there, and there is a lot of attention being paid to that. But there's a, a flip side to that, almost like the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. So there's a lot of attention paid to how do we mitigate and, and stop the harm that has been done and can be done by un, uh, unthoughtful application of machine learning in particular. But there's a flip side to that, the sort of wellness uh, aspect. Um, just one example, it's from the private sector, but I think it, it's generally applicable. In, in, uh, in the private sector, landlords, person, you know, private landlords um, often just don't have confidence in the tools that are available to calibrate whether or not a particular potential tenant is likely to skip out on rent or not. And so what they do is they just have this blanket approach, typically. Um, up front, you have to give the first and last month's rent. Now, for an affluent uh, potential uh, renter, that's maybe an, a mild inconvenience. It's not a showstopper. There are whole groups of, of the potential renter population for whom that's a deal breaker. They just simply don't have that kind of, of reserve money available. Um, 
if a uh, conf if, if landlords had real confidence in the use of machine learning based uh, uh, tools to really accurately reflect the potential risk of, of skipping out on rent, they could reduce or even even drop those requirements for uh, the first and last month's rent. That doesn't really affect the affluent renters much, but that's a game changer for potential renters that, that uh, otherwise can't get into that market. Um, there are other examples, certainly as well, I, uh, um, of particular benefit that um, if used well and thoughtfully um, can actually really be uh, an enabler for uh, more equity and, and more justice. The other point I'd make briefly is the other potential advantage of, of uh, AI technologies with respect to equity and fairness is that, um, at least in principle, they allow for those decisions to be made explicitly and deliberately and transparently. And now, often they're made implicitly ad hoc and in people's heads. And you have to use sort of um, uh, course measures to try and, and determine whether statistically there's disparate impact, for example. Um, again, done well and done intentionally, uh, machine learning in uh, as a decision aid for consequential uh, decisions that affect uh, the population could provide better transparent and, and explicit insight into the, the underlying uh, input into those decisions, which could mitigate the implicit bias that, that we were just discussed. So done properly, we, we often think about AI and concerns about fairness and bias. Done properly, it can actually enhance fairness and bias and, and promote equity and, eth and ethical activity. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there's just as there's some galvanizing examples already of the unintended uh, negative consequences, um, there are some, some early examples of, of the positive benefits as well. Um, and it's just a matter, uh, again, I think as Commissioner Clyburn said, the, the really key point about these complex socio-technical systems and whether they, they enhance uh, equity and justice or, or undermine it has nothing to do with what runs on electricity. It's, it's about the people and policies surrounding that. I often, um, you know, tell people no matter or, or suggest to people when they're at different points in their lives to remember their own prime directive or North Star, um, to ask yourself why you launched or, or, or started along this path. Um, to me, that is a, a, a question when it comes to AI and uh, ML and all of uh, you know these uh, uh, vehicles or tools um, that we must ask ourselves, selves, what is the goal? What is the objective? What are we uh, trying to achieve? To what end? If we ever lose those series of North Stars, uh, you know, that is where uh, the problem, uh, you know, comes in. And it's got to be um, our strength um, uh, in this country is the very mosaic uh, that attracts others here. Um, and to me, when it comes to, uh, uh, again, these systems, it needs to be as reflective of that um, as it is um, of our, uh, what we see is that melting pot and in, in quilting uh, of the country. No part of the development or evolution of these systems should be devoid of those strengths. Great insights, thanks to both of you. And in a moment, we're actually gonna turn to our attendees for questions. Uh, again, please put questions in the chat and we'll um, have a moderated discussion uh, thereafter. I do have one final question for uh, our two panelists, and that is uh, really we're taking off on the last two, two comments, which is how does government move forward in terms of developing policy like that uh, led by uh, our congressional representatives that we heard about earlier, um, thinking about technology strategies and data strategies that really promote ethical and equitable AI? Um, and what did either one of you can start. Commissioner Clyburn? I say government should lead by example, which is it has done. When it comes to a, a lot of these technologies and systems, government led the way uh, through research and development. Um, and so I think government should continue to be as aggressive. Now government has its issues by way of AI talent. Um, and, and that is very real. Uh, people are moving to private industry. Um, we don't have enough educators that will help 
continue to grow this, you know, th this talent. Um, we have challenges within our uneven and unequitable uh, pipelines, meaning our school systems. So all of these things need to be at um, uh, in our line of sight. And to me, government uh, is the uh, one of the best state, local, um, uh, and federal are, are uh, collectively. Uh, would be the, the best teachers uh, for all of us and to include private industry. How best to on-ramp, how best to um, uh, in, ensure that um, the goals and objectives, uh, as, 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 as was mentioned, you know, how, how best to see that that happens. Um, you honestly, oftentimes, as creative as we are, sometimes we need a blueprint uh, to follow. And I think uh, a government is in a unique place to uh, to be that, um, uh, to, again, help us get to our North Star. Thank you. Chuck? The only two things I'd briefly add, one is that I think we, we need to recognize just how rapidly AI technology is advancing and, and, uh, and, and not just incrementally, but dramatic transformational changes on a, on a ludicrously quick basis. So it, uh, I'm also reminded of the, the great systems engineer, Fred Brooks, uh, said, we have to be careful how we fix what we don't understand. And so I think um, policy makers um, have to adopt sort of an open loop, a closed loop learning uh, uh, organizational process and, and pay attention to the implications of policy, both, both intended and unintended, and track how the technology is evolving and what, what gaps that might expose in, in policy. And, and I think um, that's, that will be uh, an invaluable way to sort of the Goldilocks uh, of neither too prescriptive and lock in a particular snapshot in time of technology, nor too abstract and, and really not have any teeth and not really shape adoption. Um, well, one of the things I, I, I did mention that um, should be a given, but it's worth having on the record, is the word ethics. I always pick a word of the day and I'll pick um, ethics. That has, ha that has to be the thread uh, that uh, binds or needs or, or, or brings this all together. It has to be um, our values, our core values, you know, have to, has to be the foundation uh, and the uh, glue uh, for all of this, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, to work and to work optimally. We have to have those checks and balances. We have to have that, you know, those baselines uh, in place. Um, it, it's not just um, okay just to have this great life-changing idea if you have put on the back burner um, all of the incredible elements um, that are the best of, um, in terms of our characteristics. So that has to be, um, uh, I know everybody, some people might be rolling their eyes, but some things are not um, as organic or intuitive uh, uh, to all of us. So I wanted to go on the record as, as affirming that. Thank you, Commissioner Kleinberg and Chuck for those critically important insights. And I think we heard before about whole of government approaches from representatives Heard and Kelly. And really, I think that the Center for Data Driven Policy uh, and other like-minded organizations like our center um, at, at IBM that I lead and, and other, uh, many of whom are, are here on this webinar uh, joining us, really all have a role to play in expanding these sort of ethical frameworks that, that you talked about and driving these principles into strategies and policies and actions and technologies that are produced with and for government. Um, so- Do you mind if I- Yeah, Chuck, go ahead. Shamelessly behind something that both of you, you said, just, uh, um, and, and that is the notion of um, the, the, the mosaic that we represent and, and the notion that um, the, it's a, the one thing that government can do is really make sure that there's a broad definition of stakeholders and make sure that all those different stakeholders have a first class seat at the table from the start. So as CONOPS and, and initial ideas about adoption of, of AI are being shaped, those stakeholders have a voice in that. It's very hard to retrofit in a just or ethical application of machine learning just before you deploy it. It's just like cybersecurity. We've learned you can't patch stuff in at the end. You have to bake it in. And government has the opportunity to get a really uh, broad uh, set of stakeholders at the table from the start to shape all of this. And there are great systems engineering tools that are, that are very useful for stakeholder engagement and early requirements solicitation. Um, but I think that's something that the government's uniquely qualified to do. 
And Dan, to uh, get the, uh, take the baton and to uh, segue, which uh, Chuck has already done, into Beverly's uh, question, we've got to be bold and unapologetic about targeting and recruiting experts and developers, um, uh, train end users, identify internal talent, and educate those in support roles from across the entire um, uh, all, all of our corners of this nation, particularly with, uh, within and around and forming partnerships with HBCUs slash MSIs. Uh, people become more comfortable and confident in systems if they see that they are a, a part of the development and evolution, if they can see themselves and their needs being met uh, transparently, as um, uh, it would be probably the second or third word, word of the day, and equitably equitably, which should be our word every day. And, and so, you know, to me, uh, in order to bolster um, uh, in terms of um, either adoption or enhancements or improvements that AI done well can do, um, we need to um, ensure that is very transparent uh, for those who would benefit the most and those who rely on it the most, like public safety and, and the like, that everyone is rowing in the same direction uh, when it comes to, um, again, that transparency, that inclusive um, evaluative matrix, and be, you know, um, you know, upfront when things worth less, less than optimally and fix what is broken as opposed to making an excuse for it. That's the latter is why people lose confidence. No one expects perfection, but they always and they should expect you to thrive. I mean, to 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 to, to drive and move towards a more uh, perfect uh, system. When that doesn't happen, and when we make excuses not to fix what is broken, that is when people start to lose more faith in our systems. Standing point, and as you said, it comes back to people and and the diverse representation of people in teams and of institutions. And you mentioned. HBCUs and other uh, institutions uh, that create that diversity of thought and, and uh, really help expand the, uh, the aperture for, for understanding how AI affects broad uh, paths and societal uh, groups. So I know we have some other questions and uh, uh, Dwayne and Dave, did you want to take over or should we just keep going? No, go, you go right ahead. You guys see him there and the, can you see him there in the chat? Dan, I think, I think Jim Cook has a question, but there's one there from a while. Right. Yeah, yeah why, don't we, in front of me. Uh, why don't we go, um, Alana, are you there? Do you want to kind of state your question again? And if Alana may be on mute. So, uh, uh, yes, I'm, I'm muted, sorry. Um, and I'll also uh, put my video. I know it's kind of... Uh, not there very you are. There you are. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I, just, I just wanted to put on the table that the the power, I mean, the empowerment of people is really also the, the power to opt out. Uh, if you're forced into any technology, then you're not empowered, uh, how, whether, how good the technology is. And so I just wanted to just put this on the table because I haven't heard anything about the power to opt out or at least the power to have control on our own data, which is also, um, something that is not talked about. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so, Ilana, one of the things that I'll uh, comment on is um, my belief that we should stand firmly on certain values uh, and against those that violate our values. Um, uh, and that includes privacy. Uh, I, I know, I think, uh, uh, Senator Klobuchar, um, uh, during the hearing was was speaking about um, you know the bill that um, she was in, uh, that she has introduced or co um, sponsored I think it's more health oriented but it, again that's a very much you know a, a vulnerability so when we talk about these technologies in our operational uh, policies that has to al uh, uh, align itself they have to align themselves with uh, uh, privacy uh, preservation another part of your um, a question dealt with uh, uh, with the European. Um, uh, uh, I don't want to say experiment because I, I'm not belittling it, but but their evolution when it comes uh, to this space, um, there are uh, several elements that are attractive. Um, but keep in mind, a, a lot of people want to just um, you know uh, 
lift and fit uh, within our systems. Our systems did not evolve, evolve in the same way. Um, there is a different DNA when it comes to the European experience, particularly online and with government and what their expectations and the American experience, which has a tendency to be a little bit more jurisdictionally um, uh, defined and, 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 and more dispersed. Uh, and so, um, again, elements, and I'm on record at the FCC of, of, of being pro this, of you being able uh, to control um, your information, you you having you know opt out, um, you know um, you know opportunities. I, I, I'm really on record um, as being um, extremely pro consumer when it comes to that. Um, but I will say that um, you know just looking at the European model and thinking that it's going to be organic for all of all or most of the elements to be adopted, where our evolutions are different. I think that in and it of itself, holistically, is an unrealistic um, expectation. And, and hopefully that doesn't sound uh, contradictory. I don't think it is. Um, uh, but um, uh, we need to move the needle and move the message when it comes to this. Because if we wait too long, um, I, I, I fear that there will not be consensus uh, down the line. Just one other one other aspect of that, um, and Elena, it's nice to see you again. I you run the uh, Montreal AI Ethics Institute uh, call with the National uh, Security Commission yesterday. Um, th there's certainly the whole notion of, of private data and control over one's data and privacy is is a is a, a, a key confidence building topic. But there's a whole second set of of considerations where opting out really isn't an option. You know, we can't opt out of being audited for our tax compliance, for example. Um, there are a lot of, of, of categories where uh, the individual citizen doesn't really have opt, it's opt out isn't, isn't the topic. But I think there the confidence building gets to transparency and the right of redress. So um, I can't opt out of being audited, um, but I ought to be able to understand why it was that I was audited and I ought to be able to get redress. I ought to be able to say, why is everybody in this zip code being audited and nobody in the zip code next door being audited? And, and so I think the complement to the right of control over one's private data are, is this transparency and the right of redress. And I think that that too has to be baked in from the start and, and does contribute to a sense of confidence and just application of, of the technology. Yeah, it's really an adaptation of core privacy principles that have proven enduring with different technologies over time and then adapting them uh, to the to AI and how it, it works in terms of taking data on individuals and, and moving forward uh, in, in the applications. Uh, I know that Jim Cook had a question, Jim. Yes, thanks, Dan. Um, uh, Commissioner Clyburn, just a, something that I wanted to, um, to, to, to grab a hold of that you mentioned and then uh, pull a couple of threads together. You, uh, when you mentioned the, um, the focus on in AI, um, identifying your North Star and designing around that, I think that's very powerful. It seems to me that the same rules could be applied to the issue of creating more equitable policy overall, whether Absolutely. it relates to AI or not. And that's obviously something that I think we all uh, need to continue to push on from the perspective of this community. But you also talked about the workforce development aspect of this and building that workforce that's AI savvy and knows how to apply it. So my question really is um, the principles that you started to lay out around uh, the, the, you know, the design concepts of building ethical, uh, building ethics and equity into it. Have you engaged with universities and the educational system about the issue of not just teaching the technical aspects of AI, but the larger principles that you're describing about how do you actually build AI solutions that are equitable? It's not a technology problem. It's a mindset problem and it's, you know, and, and, and it's the way we go about it. Are you engaging with the universities and, 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 and educational system on that type of question? So thank you for that. So uh, full transparency, I'm one of the commissioners on a National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And we have honestly had had dozens hundreds if i were to tell the uh, truth of conversations uh from the military academies to um uh, you know to uh colleges and universities the, the non-military uh, affiliated uh to those uh in that from k through 12. really i i'll, I'll say it in in mignon speak 
AI should be integrated into every single teaching protocol uh, that there is. To me, that is the only way to, in some cases, recalibrate our DNA to ensure that the principles and values are set forth. But for a, from a workforce, as well as onboarding or um, uh, ensuring that um, those in particularly the school districts or, or places where, um, honestly, a lot of support um, is, is, is absent, um, that uh, opportunities are not abound. I believe that is a part of the key to ensuring that we do have um, more talent and more opportunities and, 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 and more um, you know, uh, input uh, from uh, diverse and inclusive uh, uh, communities. So to me, the principles uh, are sound. I cannot argue with them. It is usually the application, um, well, the development, and, and then, you know, the application where uh, things get, um, you know, can take on different shades of uh, uh, undesirability. Um, so, um, so yeah, the, you know, again, I'm a PK, a politician's kid, so I can't give a monosyllabic answer. The short answer is yes, um, but we have to be intentional in terms of how it, um, how we get there. And to me, it almost starts from, um, uh, you know, the first few weeks of um, uh, that beautiful young child being on the planet, that we should be, you know, almost hardwiring ourselves to integrate, um, you know, uh, the best of these systems and our abilities, because they are a reflection of us. Chuck, anything to add? I cannot top that, no. <laughs> Um, thank you. And, and I think that the point that you last made, Commissioner Clyburn, about it's not just universities, it's really education from K, K through, through 12 and then beyond into vocational education, uh, all sure. elements. So thanks, Jim, for your question. I not everybody is a scientist. I mean, not everyone. I mean, you know, sometimes when we think about AI, we think about, you know, that, that um, uh, sorry, I'm going to... Uh, offend about 90% of the um, audience, you know, that mad scientist, um, you know, coming up with it, that, that many of the jobs and opportunities when it comes to, um, you know, these platforms, uh, you know, they may require, a, you know, a robust certificate, mod, you know, so there's no one set type of, um, you know, individual uh, that makes up the uh, um, AI or, or advanced, you know, technology, uh, machine learning ecosystem. And we need to be conscious of that and to on-ramp uh, and to provide opportunities um, all along uh, the plane. But to not, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm losing my thought in terms of, uh, but to not um, narrowly, I, I, I can't remember when we had the, the, these schools where you had to stay within a particular lane. There's a term of art I can't remember right now, uh, but you should not be, you know, there, you shouldn't remain stuck. Um, if you start out in, on, on, on one plane um, and, and want to advance to another, there needs to be um, onboarding and openings and opportunities all along um, you know, the plane. Well, that's a great note to end the panel. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Clyburn and Chuck, for such great discussion. Uh, Dwayne, I know you had some insights around balancing data. Do you want to take it away in terms of the next, next session? Well, my question was uh, very difficult to answer, so we're not going to have time for that one. Uh, but uh, how about we uh, thank the panelists one more time, and we'll turn it back over to, to Dave to transition to our next phase of the, of the panel. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very insightful discussion, and we really appreciate it. Uh, next, we're going to uh, just wrap up this launch event with our final segment. We're going to hear from Beverly Ortega Babers, another key member of our leadership team who brings executive experience uh, from the executive branch uh, implementing policy. Beverly? Thanks, Dave. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning and to be a part of the Policy Center team. I actually round out the team because except for my short time in the policy making arena, as a Senate, as a Senate staffer, I've spent most of my 30-year career as an executive in various federal agencies bringing legislation to life at the highest levels of the organization. I was, for example, Chief of Staff of the Tax Division of the Justice Department and Chief of Staff of the IRS. 
I was Chief Administrative Officer of the United States Mint, Performance Improvement Officer of the Department of Education, and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Management and Budget of the Treasury Department, where I also served as Transition Director in the last presidential election. So I'm used to using my law degree to parse between the shalls and nays and shoulds, hoping that legislative history brings clarity to an ambiguous turn of phrase, or at least that it's not a barrier to a reasonable interpretation that makes the phrase administrable. Administrable, that's a word I've used a lot. I'm also used to being on the receiving end of requests for data to support agency, OMB, and legislative decision making. So I have seen what good data decision, data driven decision making looks like. As I implemented a lot of acronyms, RRA, GPRA, GPRA MOD, FATARA, TCJA, CCA, I learned that it is possible to develop guidance and legislation in a way that achieves their objectives while also providing the right amount of discretion, flexibility, and accountability to those charged with making it work. And to do so in a way that constructively respects the reality of how organizations operate and govern themselves and work with each other in OMB. My role within the, data, the Center for Data Driven Policy is to bring my experience to bear in working with MITRE experts to capture their insights, learnings, and solutions in a way that not only informs decision makers and policymakers but that is also actionable, implementable, and impactful. These are all based on data, experiences, and or models that we developed through our FFRDCs and other work in the national interest. Our initial areas of focus are relevant for the election season. They're important additions to the policy discourse regardless of who wins. And we are hopeful that they pique your interest and lead to exploratory conversations about how our organizations may work together. So let me quickly run through six focus areas, which are captured in short information sheets that will be posted on our website soon if they're not there already. Uh, first one, data-driven policy. We define a framework that proposes planning principles, development approaches, and implementation actions for data-driven, actionable policy. Fairness and consequential artificial intelligence. You heard a lot about this, um, clearly, uh, very uh, critical topic. And we have created a life cycle ethical analysis to help incorporate ethics in AI solutions. Number three, face recognition. We tackle a few difficult to understand topics like the accuracy and differential performance of the technology and look at finding a way forward that benefits and protects everyone. Delivering mission outcomes through digital transformation, ways to accelerate technology. We um, also heard about this um, from representatives Heard and Kelly and others on Fatara. We make detailed recommendations about CIO authorities and tenure, legacy systems, future PMA focus and congressional actions among others. Number five, improper payments. We call for collaboration, data sharing and analytics across government and the private sector related to CARES Act funding to prevent and detect payment errors and fraud that could undermine the credibility and effectiveness of these efforts. And lastly, achieving transformational customer experience. We make specific and detailed recommendations to enhance existing federal guidance on how agencies can transform the entirety of their customers' experience. So we will regularly add focus areas to the website as we move forward. Um, and we're also open to hearing from you about issues that may be of interest. We are mindful that the frameworks and recommendations that we propose may reflect unintended biases that reinforce existing social and economic inequities. 
So we attempt to mitigate this potential outcome, not only by calling it out, but also by incorporating a check for systemic inequities into the solutions that we put forward. Examples of this are in our environmental security, fairness and consequential AI, face recognition and data-driven policy papers. So we're starting out strong, but these papers are a means to an end. We'd like to connect your incredible employees with ours to accomplish more together than we could separately. So we look forward to hearing from you. There are more acronyms to conquer and more legislative histories to shape. Thanks. Dave, back to you. Deb, thank you for the overview of those papers. That was great. I would like to uh, thank Representatives Kelly and Hurt for their comments, and to Dan Schenick, Mignon Clyburn, and Chuck Howe for an outstanding discussion on equitable AI, and to each of you for attending today's launch event. Over the next several months, you will be hearing from us as we will be releasing additional papers and holding events. And if you're holding events and looking for participants or have ideas on collaborating on research or projects, we can help connect you with the right MITRE experts. So please don't hesitate to contact us. We'd very much like to partner and help. Again, thank you for attending, and we look forward to working with you and your organizations.